You know, most, most park rangers will tell you their, their first bug was when they were a kid. So I grew up in Greenville County and went to Table Rock and Paris Mountain and uh, spent a lot of time camping there and walking in the woods and, and uh, you know, just really love being in the outer doors and really enjoy being with people. Uh, so from a very early age, I knew that I wanted to be a part of something really special and, and see and, and talk to folks about the special resources that are South Carolina. Hunting Island is a, a really special place, and as, as y'all will see today, uh, it's one of those unique places that combines natural and cultural resources in a very unique spot. Uh, with the historic Hunting Island Lighthouse that was built in 1873, to the maritime forest that is, showcases you know, a barrier island in South Carolina. You really get that feel of being in a tropical paradise when you come here with the maritime forest. Flora, fauna, the beach, the ocean, it's just really a really a special place for South Carolinians. Not just a statewide treasure, but really a national treasure that we have right here in our own backyard. You know, being from Greenville, I grew up at the foothills and in the base of the mountains. But every South Carolinian has this rite of passage that you ask, you know, what did you do this summer? And we went to the beach. And so it's kind of like a rite of passage for all South Carolinians to go to the beach, our beach. Regardless of where you're from in South Carolina, you go to the beach. And one of the unique things about places like Hunting Island and Edisto Beach State Park and in Huntington Beach and Myrtle Beach and some of those places that we're responsible for is we really see what happens to people and families and those connections they make to their state. Hunting Island is one of those special places that you come here and you watch people and, and they're connected not only to each other and their families, but they're connected to the resource and to the state. It's, um, it's, it's a very special place and it's kind of hard to describe. It's, you know, it's, I've heard people describe it as spiritual, as, as places where they you know, recharge their batteries, that, where you can get disconnected but still be connected and, and, and then walk away you know, feeling, feeling renewed and refreshed. And uh, you know, that's why these places are so important uh, for not only this generation, but for future generations too. And, and, and what we do today will impact what happens to those future generations and the memories that they'll be able to make. And, and that's what makes, you know, how you manage our coastal communities and our parks uh, complicated and complex. Uh, the tourism industry in South Carolina is enormous. Uh, and the coastal tourism is, is tremendous. Over $80 billion are, are generated through tourism in South Carolina. $790 million in local and state taxes are paid because of the tourism economy. That generates a lot of a lot of jobs for people uh, and impacts on local communities. So one of the things that has changed for, for me in my role and for parks in general is that, you know, 80 years ago when parks were developed, we really concentrated on everything that was behind the gates of a park. You can no longer do that today. Hunting Island is an economic engine for this local community and for Beaufort County. Uh, the things that we do inside the park directly have an impact on things that go on outside of the park. So when we make decisions, we now have to be conscious and cognizant of the fact that we're making decisions that impact people outside of the gates. It's, it's economic reasons. It's, it's the restaurant owners, the hotel owners, uh, the mom and pop stores that are along the way here that rely on tourism and rely on this place uh, being able to have thousands of people come to it and visit and have that impact to where they want to come back. Uh, so it's really complicated now. It's not just managing park resources behind the gates and doing just the right thing because it's the park thing to do or the environmentally correct thing to do. It's much more than that. It's, it's economics. It's social. It's, uh, it is environmental. Uh, so you have to bring all these things into play when you, when you start managing parks and how we take care of the shoreline how we take care of these natural and cultural resources. Hunting Island is, is obviously a barrier island. And by their very nature, barrier islands move and shift. That's what they do, and that's what they're supposed to do. So over the years, Hunting Island has moved and shift 
Uh, we have a tremendous erosion rate here. So we have uh, periodically, we re-nourish the beach to help preserve and protect this, this natural wonder that we have here. So uh, it, has, it has moved and shift. Uh, we've lost a lot of beach, a lot of shoreline because of natural erosion. Uh, so the, the, the big question and the challenge is, you know, is that worth it? Uh, and, and we look at that really hard. And, and again, the complex part of that is that it's not just a, a question that can be answered just on the natural standpoint. You got to take in cultural, social, and economics. Uh, but it is such a treasure that the, the return on investment, not only financially, and there is a tremendous return on investment financially for renourishment, uh, but the other is the return on investment for the economics that it does to this community, the return on invest, investment for that, that tonic for the soul that we get when we come to a special place like this is, uh, is certainly some of those factors that we have to take in mind and, and, and we think very worth doing this. You know, one of the things when we first talk about renourishment, everyone seems to focus on the beach. And, you know, we're going to put sand on the beach, and is, it, is that necessary to continue to put sand on the beach? But it's really more complicated than that. It's, it's protecting infrastructure. It's doing what a barrier island does. It's protecting Highway 21. But more importantly, and, and during the recent storm, Hurricane Matthew, it was brought to our attention, and really what I thought was a profound statement of the, the impact that Hunting Island had with the destruction that Matthew did for Hunting Island. And someone said, but you know what? Hunting Island did her job and protected Beaufort. And so it's the natural part of a barrier island protecting the mainland, but it's also that complicated standpoint of Hunting Island and re-nourishing and taking care of this beach protects infrastructure like roads, water, sewer, economic infrastructure, all of those kind of things have to be have to be brought into play when you make the decisions of of do we continue to renourish, do we continue to maintain and preserve and protect these islands. Well, well obviously we hear both extremes. The extreme of let nature take its course and you know let mother nature do what mother nature does. Uh, and then the others are you know, that we're not being proactive enough and we need to re-nourish annually instead of every eight to 10 years in the cycle that we've done. Uh, and, and so we hear both of those sides and all in between. And, and I think the answer is that we have, we have determined and deemed that the cost benefit of taking care of, of, of these islands and the taking care of our shoreline and our coastline far outweighs the minimal amount of money that we spend on it because of those other factors that I talked about from social, economic, uh, and protecting and preserving a place that is very special. So I, I guess where we're at now with, with a lot of talk about sea level rising and climate change and those kind of things, everyone is looking to us and say, so what is the answer? And you know, my answer to that is that I'm just an old park ranger, uh, but I am smart enough to know this. It's really complicated. And what we really need to focus in on, we need to have a variety of disciplines sitting at the table and determining how we manage this process and, and how we manage this phenomenon that is going on that, you know, that, that doesn't need any more argument and discussion on, it needs action. And I think what the action is, is that you get a wide variety of disciplines and opinions and we sit at the table and we determine what is important based on all these factors, environmental, social, economics, and find out a real solution that's viable, that's economically sound, and sustainable long-term to preserve and protect special places like this. Uh, and, and, and the biggest argument that I have of why you protect this is I can't articulate it uh, in a conversation like this, but I can walk you through this park today and the number of wows that you will have and the number of amazing, astonishing looks that you'll have, you'll walk away and say, oh yeah, this is worth saving and protecting because I want my children and my grandchildren to see this. Now we need to roll up our sleeves and figure out how you do that. This satisfies all the parties and that we do the right and responsible thing.
Hurricane Matthew was an interesting storm that kind of just hovered out over the coastline. Never was a direct hit at Hunting Island, but it, it stayed so close. Uh, the storm surge was very significant and the wind pounded Hunting Island, so we lost a lot of trees. So where we're standing right here, uh, we would be underwater, we'd be under ocean water. Uh, the storm surge went inland into our campground and past the lighthouse. We had a storm surge of about nine feet. So where we would be right now uh, would be well over my head, maybe twice the size of me right here because we were so close to the ocean. But a nine foot, a nine foot surge went further inland. Uh, so, you know, we would completely be underwater. Uh, a lot of the, the signs of what Matthew did are still here. Uh, we have a bench just close by that, you know, people say that, wow, that's a short bench. Well, it's covered in sand that, that Matthew washed ashore. So there's still a lot of evidence of what Matthew did. And, and then right behind Matthew comes Irma. Irma hit uh, just bad timing, uh, came at a king tide, at a high tide. Uh, so where I would have been standing during Irma would have also been underwater just because of the extreme high tides. Uh, but Mother Nature is very resilient and this island is very resilient. And we come back and we recovered and you know, hope to reopen Hunting Island this week. At Hunting Island, we have probably lost over the last 35 years, 50 to 60 facilities. Uh, and one of those reasons were is that early on, we built a lot of things really close to the shoreline. Uh, our policy for the last 10 years has been that we will not rebuild anything that's on the shoreline. We have done a planned retreat and we go back a little further and let the natural environment be the coastline, the shoreline. Uh, it, it is a barrier island, and it's not a question of when or, or if it's going to be another storm. It's a question of when and how you're prepared for it and how you're set up for it. Uh, it it's, you know, we lost during Matthew, we lost five facilities, a uh, campground, uh, a couple of restrooms, and, and the decision after Matthew is the campground that is the closest that was the closest to the ocean. We have uh, abandoned that campground and uh, we have another campground that's further back inland, that's, that's better protected, but we won't rebuild that campground that's right on the ocean. People would love to have a campground right on the ocean, but it's really not sustainable. And uh, so we've learned our lesson over the years that, you know, to put facilities as far away from the ocean that you can, but provide access for people to go to the beach and enjoy the ocean and enjoy their beach. I cannot, you know, it, it's, and, and I don't even like to think about it. You know, Hunting Island will certainly change. Hunting Island has changed in my career, uh, but it's still magical. And it still has those features that, you know, that are hard to explain. You have to see it, touch it, feel it, experience it. You know, those are the things that, that, that makes me not even want to ever imagine there not being a Hunting Island. Hunting Island will change, uh, but I can't imagine us not having it. And, and I, you know, it's, it's that part that is hard to explain. It's that social, it's that culture that an old boy from Greenville uh, still comes here and, and feels that magic and still needs the beach, even though that it, you could be from York County or Greenville County or Oconee County or Richland County, but you still need the beach because it defines who we are as South Carolinians. So we need these special places and, and for that reason alone. Uh, but then you factor in all those other reasons from the economy and, and saving and preserving and protecting of the ecosystem that is Hunting Island with loggerhead sea turtles, with birding populations, with you know a species of deer that is only found here at Hunting Island, you know, all of those reasons make it, you know, make it worth, worth saving and I can't imagine there never being a Hunting Island. Uh, again, it's complicated and, and I'm not avoiding the question other than to say there will be winners and losers. And, and I think the only way that we're going to be winners in this is you have to have that diverse set of disciplines sitting at the table 
and, and putting politics aside, putting what, what your expertise is aside to be able to listen to all these factors. Because it's not just an environmental question. It really is an economic question. It really is a social question. And you have to have those disciplines sitting at the table so that you can make decisions that, that will last and are sustainable. And, and one day, yeah, you may have to make those decisions that, you know, we can't do this anymore. Or we can do this, but we'll do it different. And, you know, and it's still my hope that there's some technology out there that'll help us manage this process. Uh, but we have to manage it and, and we have to prepare for it. Uh, and, and the way to do that is to start having dialogue, all the disciplines, start having dialogue to find out the best way to manage this, not for us, but for our children and grandchildren. Yeah, our coastal parks are impacted. Our, our coastal parks are impacted quite differently, and and you know part of it is just a geography lesson for the state of South Carolina. The upper coast, it's erosion rates, and its problems are very different than the lower part of the state. The upper coast, Myrtle Beach and Huntington Beach specifically, they're a part of the mainland, so that Grand Strand Beach does not erode as fast as a barrier island does. Barrier islands down here, again by their very nature, move, shift erode, accrete. Uh, so our philosophy is much different. Uh, it's, it's more immediate, uh, more dramatic in the lower part of the state with Edisto and Hunting Island. Uh, Edisto Beach was renourished uh, recently, this past winter, of, uh, so, and, it, and it made a dramatic impact and a dramatic difference. So the results uh, are the same. You know, you go through this cyclical process, much like roofing your house, you have to do it every eight to 10 years, and in turn, you preserve and protect this barrier island. But it is managed very differently, and each coastal park uh, has these different unique aspects, uh, but they all, you know, people all come to these parks for one reason, and that's to see the Atlantic Ocean. And, you know, it's, um, again, a special, special feeling to be able to see the Atlantic Ocean and, and hear its roar, and uh, so we do manage them differently. Uh, it is a more immediate, dramatic, uh, visual picture on the lower coast because there are barrier islands than what you see at Huntington Beach and Myrtle Beach. The economic impact, still the same. Uh, Hunting Island and Edisto, again, probably more profound because we impact this small community that we're really a part of. And Huntington Beach and, and Myrtle Beach are part of a bigger uh, infrastructure that is the Grand Strand Myrtle Beach product. But here, it's about communities. Uh, all, all of the parks are, are important. They're important in different ways to different parts of the community. But it is very dramatic seeing the difference between the lower part of the state and the upper coastline, just because one is attached to the, to the, lane, to the mainland and one is barrier islands. Yeah, we, we do talk to our neighbors, and uh, not only our neighbors with Georgia and, and North Carolina, but all up and down the coast. And we look at different models. Uh, and, and one of the things that, that we've learned is that it's, it's very, the impact of erosion and, and um, coastal flooding, it, it's really site specific more than, than you would think. So you really have to look at it individually, but we do talk to, uh, to our neighboring states and, and a lot of states further up north about how they are managing uh, coastal flooding, changes in shoreline, uh, and, and, and one of the bigger issues that, that we all have to manage with, with places like Hunting Island is capacity issues uh, about you know, how many people we can come in and visit Hunting Island or any of our coastal properties and where do you, where do you find that line because we're getting more and more demand on these coastal properties for people to come in. So, it's not just managing, you know, sea level rising, coastal erosion, coastal flooding, but it's managing how you get people in there. And we probably have more conversations with, with my counterparts in those, part of the, those parts of the country that are close to us about how you manage these carrying capacity issues uh, with how many people can come to this sensitive area than we do on some of the scientific stuff that is, that is done with offshore, you know, 
renourishment issues and those kind of things. But it, it, again, it's, it's important and it's critical that we have dialogue with all the people because somebody's, somebody's going to get this thing right before it's over with and we'll learn from it. You know, I, I think certainly the, the shoreline will change. Uh, again, the very nature of barrier islands, they move and they shift. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that makes it complicated again is that when, when we put people on these islands in communities, in residential communities, we've adapted those islands to where they can't do what they normally would do. So we have to manage them. If we're gonna habitate these, these islands, we have to manage those. And, and I think there's, a, I think there's a, a, a fine line, but I think there's middle ground to where you would manage these islands to where they would always be preserved and protect. Look different, maybe not be as big, maybe look a little different, have different aspects than they ever have before. But I think we have to strive to do that. You know, a great example is, is this lighthouse used to be about a mile and a half from the ocean. And now it's a couple of hundred yards. So, you know, one of our goals for future generations is preserve and protect this lighthouse area. Uh, and again, it goes back to us because it's a special place, but also the economy of scale of what you can do to preserve this or one day move that lighthouse again. And so is it worth putting some sand on the beach or letting the lighthouse go or to move it? Uh, and we think there's, there's common ground to where you manage all these barrier islands where they complement each other. Uh, but, you know, it's complicated. It's, it's complicated. And, and I don't have the answers, and I'm not sure one group of advocates have the answers. I, I think it's going to require a diverse group of disciplines where people sit down and really figure out what our next steps are.